in the book here, we're, we'll, we'll come back this time and talk about the uh, ultraviolet catastrophe. And we may be facing education kind of ultraviolet catastrophe. I'll come back to that one in a moment too. Um, talking about knowledge, uh, when you spoke initially a few moments ago, you talked about three different levels, three different types of knowledge. And those types of knowledge were digital, the dirty digital zeros and ones, the analog forms of knowledge, and then the quantum forms of knowledge, which are on a much higher scale. Could you expand on that a little bit to actually explain how that all fits in? Yes, so um, again, this is something which um, I guess I appreciated as I was writing the book, um, that you know, I was trying to describe what is the quantum world. Now, as physicists, we know the right equations, and we can play with those equations and study systems, but, but we're not very good at explaining things in everyday terms, especially things that are not explicable in everyday terms. Uh, we don't usually try to convey how different the quantum world is uh, from our classical picture of the world. So, uh, so it forced me to think about this, and um, the, the, the fact that everybody talks so... You see, there, there's a tension, there's this huge tension today, uh, which is summed up very nicely by the comedian uh, Louis C.K. And I found this quote by sheer accident on the web. On, on the web. So Louis C.K. is uh, he's sitting on an airplane, and um, he discovers they have, uh, they have the web in the air. Okay, so you can access the web. Now they have Wi-Fi on, a, on an airplane. So he sits there, and they announce this over the intercom. We have Wi-Fi on the flight today. So everyone opens their laptops, and they're all surfing the web. And then the, then the thing uh, goes down for a few minutes. And the guy sitting next to him complains like hell. Oh, these incompetent airlines, they can't even run a Wi-Fi system up in the air. You know? And he's thinking, you know, Three days ago, the guy didn't have this <laughs> at all. Now he has it, and he just takes it for granted, and when it fails, he says, oh, it's incredible. Yeah. So he summed it up by saying, everything's amazing right now, and nobody's happy. <laughs> and for me, that kind of epitomizes the digital revolution. Digital revolution has brought with it access to huge amounts of information, um, and, um, and yet, somehow it's also brought with it this incredible sense of overload. Uh, there's just too much of the stuff, and if you work you know, in an office or in, in many jobs, you're inundated with emails uh, all the time, and so it's kind of opened up more things that you can do, but we all feel like we're sort of drowning in the sea of information. Um, and that makes us very unhappy. Um, and so I think it is a feature of today's society that we are both anxious, very anxious about the future, if there will be a future, and also very unhappy, even though, as Louis C.K. says, everything's amazing. But, uh, so, now, now, what does this actually mean? So, the fascinating thing is that there's a clear parallel between this and the progress of physics. And the parallel is what's called the ultraviolet catastrophe. Okay. Now, the ultraviolet catastrophe, what does it mean? Uh, it means that uh, Maxwell discovered that light um, comes in waves. And so there are waves which travel through space, like waves on water, and they have a wavelength, uh, the, the distance between the crests of the wave. And so, you know, red light has slightly longer wavelength, uh, blue light, shorter wavelength. And if you go to even longer wavelengths, you get to radio waves, even shorter wave wavelengths, you get to x-rays. All these things are just waves in the electromagnetic field. But what Maxwell discovered is that you can have waves of any wavelength, from zero up to infinity. And, um, and they all exist in nature. And Maxwell tried to put this, or not Maxwell, later people tried to reconcile this with the way in which the world works. That we have objects that can radiate light or 
radio waves or other electromagnetic radiation, and objects that can absorb uh, that radiation. So the whole world is like a big marketplace where energy is exchanged all the time, just like money is explained, exchanged in the market. But it's energy that's going back and forth in these waves. So this room right now is, this, is filled with waves, of all wavelengths, carrying energy from me to you, and from you to me, and uh, you know, that's the way the, the, the world operates. The problem with this is that the short waves, which are the ultraviolet waves, Ultraviolet light. Ultra just means very. Okay, so uh, violet is, is the bluest light you can think of. And ultraviolet means very, very blue, and that actually just means very short wavelength waves. The problem is that you can have infinitely many very short wavelength waves fit into any volume of space, because they're very tiny. And if you took this theory seriously, this uh, theory of light and, and waves, those infinitely tiny waves, because there are so many of them possible, they would absorb all the energy in the world. So if you lit a match, all of its energy would instantly go into these ultraviolet waves. And so you couldn't have any, no a star would die out immediately. A cup of tea would, would become cool instantly if all these ultraviolet waves were allowed to take up the stuff. And so it, it was called the ultraviolet catastrophe, meaning that the world didn't make any sense, because everything would lose its heat uh, instantly. And, you, and so uh, it was as if you, you had this picture of the world which allowed this um, infinite, infinite uh, amounts are in infinitely small things to suck up all the energy out of everything else. And the, the parallel is with today in the information age, as information, digital information, becomes cheaper and cheaper, it's possible for somebody to replicate a book or to uh, you know, put stuff on the internet at almost no cost. There's no cost to information. In. And so we, we all end up in the sea of this, this uh, you know, most basic form of information. So there's a flood of this stuff. And what stops that? What stops that in the physical world? The physical world doesn't work that way. It works in a quantum way. And what quantum theory tells you is that these little short waves um, cannot suck up all the energy out of everything else because they are quantized. An uh, ultraviolet wave, a very short wave, carries a very large quantum of energy. So you just, if you don't have that much energy, you just can't emit short wavelength radiation at all. And this was a consequence of quantum theory and this imaginary nature of reality, uh, that it rescued the world from the ultraviolet catastrophe. And in the same way, our information age is leading towards information becoming cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. So in 10 years time, your laptop will hold every book that has ever been written. Okay, you'll just be able to buy it on memory sync. Do you want every book? Yeah, here it is. <laughs> <laughs> this is. This is coming. This will be here 10 years from now. Um, oops, there's no one written today. You better revise it. But, um, so there's an extraordinary capacity for information. But about 10 years from now, also, that capacity to cheapen information is going to come to an end. Why? because the size of the transistors are shrinking. That's how information has become so cheap. We've been able to shrink transistors down to the size of the atom. And in about 10 years from now, the smallest transistors will be a few atoms across. When you get to that point, you can't go any further because uh, you, you, you can't make a transistor out of one atom. And atoms don't work in digital ways. Atoms work in quantum ways. And that's what's coming. Ten years from now, we will reach the quantum limit for transistors. And like it or not, if you want to make a better computer, you have to make it a quantum computer. And when you make it a quantum computer, you open, open up this entirely new vista, which, which contains vastly more information, but in a far more subtle, um, um, and, and, 
self-aware form. Okay, digital, you see, in digital information, if something is a zero or one over here, and, and a zero or one over there, those things are independent. You can't, you, you, you can imagine, I don't know, a sign um, with its, uh, the different components being on or off. And whether this one's on or, on or off has absolutely no influence on whether the other one's on or off. That is not the way the quantum world works. In the quantum world, everything is aware of everything else all the time. Okay? So in the classical world, another illustration, the classical world, if I throw a ball against the wall, the ball will fly through the air. The ball knows nothing about the wall until it hits the wall. That's how classical mechanics works. There is zero influence of the wall on the motion of the ball until the ball hits the wall. And that's our mental picture of the world. Quantum mechanics doesn't work like that. In quantum mechanics, the ball knows the wall is there from the moment you release it. Everything knows about everything else all the time. And that's why it all works. It's fundamental to it all working. And so when you think, how, what's this going to mean for information? Well, it means that we need to use information in a very different way. That when we use information, we will need to use information about everything all the time. And so I think that's a very exciting prospect. Uh, it, it, and it will frankly raise us from our current status as, I would say, analog beings. We formulate our world in analog terms. We're going to have to start formulating the world in quantum terms. And so one of the speculations I make is that just as the digital DNA code codes for us as living organisms, okay, and, and we're much more interesting than our DNA code. I mean, DNA code is a pretty boring thing. It's just a string of letters. Um, it doesn't look alive to me, <laughs> okay? It isn't alive. It's just a string of letters. It codes for us, and I think there's a complete misconception by people like Richard Dawkins, who talks about the selfish gene, as if we are the instruments of our DNA. Okay, but, but I would see it the other way around. We're the interesting thing, right? We're alive. The DNA is useful because it stores information very accurately, and you can reproduce it. But, uh, so I think he has it exactly backwards. But um, uh, the, our digital code, uh, our digital uh, DNA, codes for us as analog beings. We operate on a higher level of reality because we are part of the natural environment which, which works in at least analog ways. Okay? But then we as analog beings, we will be the code for the quantum computers which operate, will operate on a higher level than us. But just as we need our DNA to reproduce, the quantum computer is going to need us to give it definite um, motivations and to make decisions. So if you're aware of everything all the time, it's probably quite confusing. <laughs> you need somebody to come along and say, well, I want to actually do this, uh, or to remember. And I believe the quantum world will actually need this, just like we need our DNA. But that prospect of quantum life operating on a higher level than we operate on is, I think, uh, pretty